You are listening to the Southwestern American Choral Directors Association Connections podcast, where we will interview choral directors, leaders, and movers and shakers within our region. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Wall. We hope you enjoy these conversations. Please like and subscribe this YouTube channel for future content. Good day, everyone. Uh, Today, I'm releasing this connection with Dr. Jeffrey Allen Murdoch. Uh, Dr. Murdoch is our Southwestern ACDA president. He is internationally known as a conductor and clinician, serves as director of choral activities, founding director of the Arkansas Center for Black Music and associate professor of music at the University of Arkansas. He is also the 2021 Grammy Music Educator of the Year. Uh, This particular recording happened in Denver as we were on a pre-planning site visit, uh, preparing for this 2024 Southwestern ACDA conference. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation that I had in person, the first of this podcast with Dr. Jeffrey Allen Murdoch. (laughs) Okay, here we go. We are here in Denver in the embassy suites um, as we are starting this SWACTA planning period. Uh, We had pre-planning meetings and going all over the place, uh, looking at things and trying to make sure this conference is set up correctly for everybody. Uh, but we're here with Dr. Jeffrey Allen Murdoch uh, to learn a little bit more about you and uh, as our president for Southwestern ACDA, tell us a little bit about Jeffrey Allen Murdoch, the younger, uh, your early years and your musical upbringing. Ah, uh, uh, thanks for having me, Jeff Wall. Um, let's see, my uh, early years. So I started playing piano when I was five. Um, I was born in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, But I started playing classical piano when I was five, and um, it was really because I was always beating on something or pretending to play something. Um, As a kid, I would be like mesmerized when people would, uh, when I saw musicians doing their thing, and so somebody had this idea that I should take I should take piano lessons. And so I couldn't afford them, but uh, we had a family friend who paid for lessons for me. It was $5 a week. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, and so we, we did that, and so I started, I started playing. Now, as a kid growing up in the Baptist church, in the black Baptist church, um, you can't play an instrument and then not be expected to get on an instrument when you get to church. Right. So I would, <laughs> I would go to church and um, somebody might start singing something if there wasn't a musician on the piano or the organ or whatever. It'd be like, hey, you play, get up on that instrument. I'm like, but I don't know the song. I don't care, get on there anyway, right? And so it was that sort of, it was that sort of thing. Figure it out. Yeah, figure it out. And so as I was learning, you know, how to play hot cross buns and Mary Had a Little Lamb and whatever it is that one learns when they are, uh, when they're learning piano early, um, I was also developing my ear because, you know, when Sister Shirley gets up there singing Amazing Grace in four different keys at the same time, mm-hmm. um, you have to follow that. Right, right. <laughs> um, you, you, you learn very quickly how to, how to do a lot of things. And so um, I got my start on the piano. I started playing in earnest at church uh, when I was nine. I started playing for the Sunday school, um, which was a really cool experience. Um, I wasn't allowed to take any money though because I was a kid and I needed to still learn the things and so it was kind of a job like I had to do it but mm-hmm. nobody paid me I don't know maybe somebody did get paid and uh, I don't know and, <laughs> and I never saw it I don't know but I I never saw any 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 money until You're helping somebody though. yeah I was helping somebody <laughs> helping somebody and um, uh, and that responsibility grew a bit more when I was in uh, middle school. And so I did play and I got paid and I started directing choirs actually even when I was that age too. So um, choral directing, even though it wasn't like choral directing as we as, as I do now, um, I've, it's been a part of my life for a really long time as well. Um, so during my, um, so while all that was happening with piano and all that stuff, I also uh, sang in choirs. Um, so I sang in my elementary choir at Nativity BVM Elementary School in Biloxi, Mississippi, which I was also scholarship to go. Okay, um, shout out. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I was able to do that, and so I would sing at the uh, midnight Christmas mass from time to time and those sorts of things. Uh, and I was also in band starting in fourth grade, so I started playing the trombone. 
Uh, and I had a I had a knack for learning instruments pretty quickly. So uh, in fourth grade, I played trombone. In fifth grade, I played the euphonium. By sixth grade, I was playing the tuba, which is also interesting and important because as a sixth grader living in Biloxi, which um, is a place that was also famous for Mardi Gras. Right. Um, you had to march in Mardi Gras parades, and so there's little Jeffrey, sixth grade Jeffrey, walking around with a big sousaphone. Oh wow! On <laughs> yeah, I didn't know uh, your brass multiple, background. That's yeah, cool. yeah. Cool. Um, so I did all that, and I played um, brass instruments throughout high school. Actually, by the time I was a senior, I um, I finished up on the French horn. I was drum major my junior and senior year, but I also played uh, French horn in the in the band. So I've had a lot of choral music and uh, instrumental music in my background. Um, let's see, when I was a junior in high school, um, our choir went to contests, what is what we called it. Um, it's known by many different names in different states, but we went to contests and I heard a choir sing Moses Hogan's Elijah Rock. It was Ocean Springs High School. Mary Elizabeth Sawyer was the choir director and it changed my life. I knew from that day that I wanted to be a choir director. I was like, I want to be able to create that kind of music um, one day with an ensemble, and I never looked back. And so That's I went to school for it, um, did a bachelor's and master's in uh, music education and choral conducting, respectively. Um, went and taught high school in Memphis. Did you say where was that? Um, that was at the University of Southern Mississippi okay. for my undergrad and master's with Dr. Greg Fuller. Shout out, Greg Fuller. Mm, shout out. Um, and uh, I went and taught high school in Memphis for 10 years. Uh, and that was some of the most valuable experience because during that time, I was able to really hone my craft. Um, I learned a lot about music. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about students and how they learn. Mm -hmm. I also learned a lot about the disparities that exist in music education, depending on who you are, where you live, how much money you have, um, what your race is or uh, ethnic identity is. And so all of those things I found to be, uh, I found to be dividing lines uh, about, in terms of access um, for those students. Um, the students were treated differently because they went to a particular school, they were um, funding was allocated differently because they went to a different school because they because they were lived in a part of, certain part of town. Um, funding in terms of uh, not just you know being able to go on trips and things like that, but like um, uniforms and mu being able to purchase music and all of those sorts of things. Basic access. Basic access, yeah. and so um, I also found that students. Um, were expected to not perform as well as students from more affluent communities. Hmm. Um, and so it was there that I was determined to prove everybody wrong and beat the system and teach the students to read without um, having them lose their identity, without having them lose the things that are important to them. And so in those 10 years in Memphis, I began to use culturally relevant pedagogy before I even knew what it was. Mm -hmm. um, I thought when I started teaching that I would just do it for two or three years and then go get a DMA and then go and be a director of choral activities somewhere at a college somewhere. Um, but it was at East High School in Memphis in particular that I realized that I wanted to do something more. I wanted to um, do the work to try to to reshape and reframe the system from the inside. And so um, I got a PhD in music education. And along the way, all of my research um, was focused on um, those disparities that I described earlier, mm -hmm. cultural love and pedagogy, music in urban schools, um, and all of those things. What can we do to make music and music education more equitable? and give students more access. And so that's what I did at the University of Memphis. Um, completed my PhD in 2015. And uh, my first job out of the gate was at the University of Arkansas. Um, one of the cool things about the U of A is that 
I am able to do all of the things that I really love. Um, it's like all of my favorite things wrapped in one. So I get to do music education. Um, I was hired to, to coordinate all things related to choral music ed. In addition to that, I am conducting traditional choral ensembles, which is something that I grew to love uh, over many years. I also get to do um, a gospel ensemble, and now I'm shaping um, a, and curating a, a whole program in black sacred music, which I think is important, is how I got my start. Um, and it's something that's um, not it's not researched as well as it should be. Yeah, so stop for a minute and plug that program. Yeah. So one, through um, the generosity of the Alice L. Walton Foundation, um, we were able to start the Arkansas Center for Black Music. And so the Center for Black Music is, um, uh, it is the umbrella that houses this master's degree in black sacred music that I'm talking about, which I'll come back to. Um, um, our jazz studies program is housed under this umbrella now. Um, also, we are starting a journal series, which, is, which will be a repository um, for new um, existing and new and emerging research in black sacred music um, through the University of Arkansas Press, which I'm really excited about. Yeah. Um, and also, we have multiple programs like the Black Music Symposium, which we do every single year, our jazz festival, uh, and there'll be new programming um, that'll be coming out as well. The master's degree in black sacred music is the first of its kind in the world. Um, heretofore, folks could go to basically any university to get a, a degree in sacred music. You can get a church music degree in, in any state, just about. Right. Um, but those degrees do not take into account the black experience. Um, I learned that there are so many musicians who are working in black churches um, all over the country who desire to further their studies, to um, make themselves more marketable for upward mobility, to um, salary increases, things like that. Um, but there hasn't been a place to do that where you can learn hymnology mm -hmm. and church music history and all of those things through the lens of black sacred music. Um, when, you're, when you're in these sacred music programs, a lot of times, um, you know, you don't learn much about gospel music and spirituals. And so this is the first of its kind in the world. Um, in this program, we've hired experts from um, all over the world to come and teach, which is why it's designed like a three summer master's program okay. um, uh, that, that many universities use uh, for like music education programs and the like. Partly because a lot of the folks who um, who would come to this program and, and in fact the, the the demographic around whom this program was designed, um, those church musicians can't be gone for a full year or for a, a whole spring semester or fall semester, but a summer is more feasible. Pastors aren't going to let their folks go for that amount of time either, so a summer is more feasible. Also, the summer allows us to pull scholars who may be working at other universities. Right. Um, that was my next question. Yeah. yeah. Who might be working at other universities um, to work. So, for example, this summer, um, we've got Grammy and Stellar award-winning um, uh, gospel artist Kurt Carr, who is teaching songwriting courses. Um, Dr. Alicia Lola Jones, who teaches at the University of Cambridge in Oxford, um, uh, is teaching the research in black music. Uh, Well-published um, and highly respected scholar, uh, musicologist, um, who's coming across the pond to teach wow. for us in the summer. Um, Dr. Leo Davis, who is one of the, um, uh, is a phenomenal, he's a music educator, but also um, has built one of the uh, most well-known black gospel programs. And I shouldn't just say gospel because um, he was the, he's probably the person that I look up to the most in terms of taking church music and making it, black church music and making it look different. Mm -hmm. So you could go to Mississippi Boulevard from you know from the late 80s to um, till he retired just a bit ago and you might walk into the church building and get um, a traditional hymn you might hear in that same service um, hallelujah from Beethoven's Christ on the Mount of Olives mm -hmm. you might hear um, 
something, you know, a WC organ something <laughs> during communion, you might hear um, a Moses Hogan or a Dawson spiritual, and then you're going to get gospel music, and then you're going to shout and go home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so uh, it was just a very unique way of doing worship. And there are other houses of worship in the country that do this, but I watched Leo do it well. So Leo's teaching okay. um, uh, in the program as well. Um, and so many, Dr. Rod Vester, who's at Shenandoah um, Conservatory, um, is teaching piano improvisation. So that's just this year. And so we are able to bring yeah. in uh, the leading scholars yeah. to work with these folk. Um, and I think it's gonna be uh, really game changing. It sounds like, man, that's a full repository of resources, experts, all available to, to folks in this program. So mm-hmm. that's really cool, man. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm excited about that for you. I'm stoked, man. It's going to be great. Yeah, and who better to spearhead the program? That's that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that, uh, wrapping that up, did, did I give you adequate time to uh, fully go through your full musical upbringing? Uh, yeah, I think if I had to add one more thing, uh, when I lived in Memphis, I talked about Leo Davis just a minute ago when I was uh, describing the Center for Black Music and the Master of Music and Black Sector Music. However, I think that I learned more working for Leo. Um, so I spent a lot of time working for him as one of his assistants. And I learned so much from him. And I learned more working for him than I think I learned in my undergraduate choral music program. Because just, just how to program and how to work with choirs of differing abilities, how to um, get people to buy into what you're doing. Like some, all of the things that I do as a collegiate choral director, like yes, I, I learned how to do theory and I learned about music history and all of those things. I learned how to conduct, I learned all that stuff in my undergraduate master's program, in my PhD, pro- I learned how to research in my PhD program and various other things. But it was at Mississippi Boulevard that all of those tools got put into a real um, practical, experience Mm -hmm. and and I I have Leo to thank for that I think um, I wouldn't be the choir director that I am today if it weren't for Dr. Leo Davis okay that sounds very formative yeah yeah excellent okay so um, we know that you're president so I'm not going to ask what is your role with (laughs) Southwestern ACDA but tell everybody what they can expect from this conference here in Denver in 2024 February so thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for asking. Our uh, our theme is limitless, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, with this idea that um, there are no limits to what we can do in terms of choral music, uh, and what choral music can do for for our population, for our body, for the people that listen to the things that we do and watch the things that we do, for the students that we teach, um, for um, the places in which we serve, our our workplaces and the communities we serve and all of that. Um, And so when thinking about that, it was important for me to reach beyond that which is traditional for a conference. Mm -hmm. Um, So you go to the conference, you listen to some great choirs, you go to some great sessions, and then you go home. Um, what I've learned, what I've observed, is that there are many swaths of people that we have missed um, with our ACDA conferences. Um, I'm talking about um, retirees. I'm talking about children's choirs. I'm talking about um, choirs that um, are non-traditional, like your contemporary a cappella, like your jazz ensembles, um, gospel ensembles. Um, And so I wanted this to be a place where, yes, Western choral music has been the foundation of choral music history for centuries, and yes, it has its place, and yes, you will hear that on our our, our conference. But we're making space for some of these other things. Uh, In doing so, there is a, um, there'll be a few contemporary a cappella honor choirs. Um, we have expanded the age of the children's honor choir to include younger, um, mm-hmm. younger kiddos. Um, bless that poor clinician's heart. <laughs> <All right>. um, <laughs> but we um, <clears throat> creating interest sessions and immersion days. Um, we have a retiree immersion day. We have immersion days for new teachers and um, 
uh, and pre-service teachers. Yeah. Uh, we have things for music and worship so that there is something for everyone. Right. Um, hopefully, we've created opportunities for everybody to say, oh, I have a reason to go to this conference. There's something that I can get that is personally uh, and, and very intentionally designed for what it is that I do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of times you go to conferences and it's like, oh yeah, this was great. I just heard this choir, they were fantastic. My choir can never do that. Um, but also, we're creating opportunities for, if you hear this choir and you aspire to be what that is, there are opportunities for you to even um, have conversations with those conductors. What is, what is it that you do to make your choir sound that way? Well, here's a round table opportunity for you to mm -hmm. have those conversations. And so... Um, yeah, formal and informal. Yeah, formal and informal, yes. And, and to clarify, we're, we're, we're still planning to do all of the traditional things that you would see at a Absolutely. conference yes. with all the choirs that you're going to go hear and all the interest sessions, but there's this extra piece that makes it uh, go beyond the bounds yep. of, of a normal conference which makes it limitless yeah 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 indeed um i like this idea of um um social collaborative time i think that there's um you know you go to a concert and you sit next to a person and you watch and you read your program and you listen and you're in awe then you leave and go to the next thing yep. but there's not a lot of this that happens right. um at these conferences and so we are intentionally creating space and opportunity for this to happen yep. for these kinds of conversations yeah, and you and i've talked a lot about this and that's that's what i gain a lot from these conferences is just these kind of conversations uh, after a concert you know mm -hmm. we talk about how great the concert was and everything but you know, then it's the exchange of ideas, the swapping. Hey, what are you working on? What's your repertoire? What's your, yep. you know, um, uh, oh, uh, you know, can I come and watch you do this or that? And Absolutely. Yeah. So it's those kind of conversations that I think we're we're trying to foster. Yeah. In this, yep. in this conference, so you know, kudos to you for the ideas, and uh, you know, I'm happy to be a part of it just to to try to facilitate and make some of that happen. Yeah. You're killing it too. No, he no. is killing it. It's, um, it's not me. It's a full team, man. <laughs> it's a full team. Um, so those are those are two. So the main, the the first major thrust is making sure that we create space for all kinds of singing and engaging with choral music. Two is this um, creation of more intentional social collaborative moments. Yep. Yep. And the third is outreach. Um, in, in, in such a way that we come to Denver and we don't come to Denver to go to a conference and then we leave the same way we came. But we, we, we leave better, we leave refreshed, but we also leave having made this community better because we were there. Right. Um, and so there are numerous opportunities for, um, for example, our auditioned choirs who um, will perform, will also participate in a philanthropic project um, that might uh, look like going into a school that has a um, that has had a dearth in their music uh, programming opportunities that might look like um, spending time um, with uh, communities of people experiencing homelessness um, that might look like um, it might take on many many different forms mm -hmm. um, we're asking all of our choirs to help us in in different ways uh, to help to uplift the community in which we will be occupying during that time. Um, leave it better than you found it. Leave it better than we found it. Mm -hmm. um, and not in a way that is, we are here to save you, right, right. but in a way that is, um, that is hopefully meaningful and uplifting for not just the people that we serve, but for us as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, because this, this idea of like choral music has existed to um, lift the hearts of people for for centuries um, however sometimes you know we we need music you know to, to to uplift us but sometimes that tangible piece um, can be just as helpful if not more and so we want to be able to do both right absolutely yeah I'm looking forward to this too all right so let's move on so what's a piece of music that you think best embodies your personality um <laughs> probably uh probably ain't got time to die um, <laughs> it's like, like I think about like all the things that I'm doing and I feel like I'm always like going to the next thing I'm always you know I'm just moving 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 you know the song but you know it takes all of my time to praise my Jesus um, I feel like it takes all of my time to do all the things including praise my Jesus mm -hmm. um, but 
you know, I feel like I'll just keep doing this and keep it keep it moving. Uh, and one day I'll die and somebody will take up the torch. But right now, ain't got I ain't got to, time. Ain't, I ain't got, got time to die. to die. Okay, I love it. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so then uh, what is your desert island coral piece? Some one that you only one that you can have with you for the rest of time until you get saved, maybe. Yeah, um, that would be uh, the Lacrimosa from Montrose Requiem. Okay. Yep. I don't know. Why, why that one? Um, I don't know. Um, I came to. I was introduced to, to it. You know, you hear it as a soundtrack to movies and all the things. Mm-hmm. And so, I, before I even knew what it was, before I'd ever sung it, um, it just, it always just spoke to me. Um, the Requiem in and of itself is probably my favorite piece of choral music. Okay. Um, just my favorite work. Uh, and the Lacrimosa is probably, it. I'd say it was my favorite movie. It, it might not be my favorite movie, but it's just, I never grow weary of hearing, hearing the that. piece, singing it, um, playing it. Um, and so I think that would be it, actually. Nice. Do you have a particular philosophy of programming? Your choirs, maybe choirs that you clinic or work with? Um, programming, yeah. I think that um, there, you know, I like to program things that I like. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to program things that I think my students will enjoy, that I think that they will like, or whatever group I'm working with, whatever choir I'm working with, um, that they will enjoy as well. Um, what is accessible? Um, like, what will this group be able to do well? Um, and also, what's relevant now? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's nice to program all of these things that are my favorite pieces of music, but you know, if, if it's not relevant to the moment, um, if it's not relevant to the pro- the programming theme, if that's a thing, if it's not relevant to what's happening in the world, um, I don't know. Um, so kind of like purpose, season, venue, that kind of thing. Yeah, right? yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and I like to challenge the the group that's in front of me as well. So there's a little bit of that. So those are those are probably the. Those are all of the things that I think about. Um, I also think about um, cultural relevance. Who are the people in this choir? Mm-hmm. Um, from what kinds of backgrounds do those people come? Uh, and how can I help them see themselves in the music? Right. Um, so, for example, um, for the Inspirational Chorale, which I conduct at the, at the University of Arkansas, my programming is very different than it would be for an honor choir. Um, and and I've, I, I am fortunate to be able to conduct honor choirs kind of all over. And when I'm working with those choirs, um, or when I'm thinking about working with those choirs, I think about all of these things like accessibility, what are things I like, what are things I think the students will like, um, how is it relevant today. Um, but that looks different in different spaces. So I'm conducting the West Virginia Allstate in, in the spring. and for that demographic um, based on you know how um, how choral music has functioned in that state um, you know what what's important to the West Virginia Music Educators Association in terms of what they, their students need um, their the history of that area um, all, all those things influence the repertoire that I chose for that group which is different from if I'm conducting a Tennessee Allstate mm-hmm. or um, uh, I'm doing Texas Allstate actually TTBB this year which is a completely different animal right and right. a completely different set of needs um, and so all of those things along with my guiding principles um, you know I'm taking into consideration you know the regions and the um, skill level of the students that are coming in how long they'll be auditioning on those pieces of music so I can choose much more difficult music for example in Texas than I can um, at a regional honor choir in you know some some other state, just because those kids live with that music for you know a hundred years before they <laughs> before they sing it. Um, so all of those things, if I'm doing a like a one-off, like a uh, an honor choir situation, uh, for my students, 
um, the ones that are performing the music throughout an entire year. Um, I also want to make sure that it's something that they won't grow weary of, grow right, tired of. Right. So those are the main things, I think. So something comes to mind about when you're talking about culturally relevant programming, mm -hmm. and you said you want your students uh, to see themselves in the music. Mm -hmm. um, do you, and I think I know your answer, but do you want also those to see, others to see their peers in the music? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So um, one of the pillars of culturally relevant pedagogy is this idea of of creating cultural competence, not just of one group, but of multi-group, mm -hmm. mul multiple groups of people um, in an ensemble, in a classroom, in, a, in the space that you are occupying, which means that I learn about my music, but I'm learning something new about yours, and I'm learning something new about hers. Now, um, you know, we try to become all things to all people. You can't do all of that in one year. Right. Um, but over the course of a few years, um, you can be intentional about creating space and opportunity so that students can see themselves and develop an appreciation and awareness of the other, um, uh, of, the vis vis of the visibility of others mm -hmm. in, in, the in, other, yeah. in the ensemble and even ex external from the ensemble. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, that resonates with me a, a lot. So I, I thank you for, for going down that rabbit hole with me a little bit. Yeah. Um, what is a typical rehearsal format look like for choirs under your direction? Um, I tend to spend a lot of time uh, with uh, warm up and sight reading, um, voice building, so to speak. I think it's important um, that the warm up matches whatever it is that we're working on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to go in there and da 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 and then you pull up. All right, let's let's sing "Sleep." Well, how did that? How is that yeah, right. related to? Has to the, connect to the music. Yeah. A little bit. So I, I it's really okay for range build, range extension. And yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah. But I I do think that sometimes we mindlessly do those things, and or we'll you know we'll mindlessly sing solfege, but you know the the vowels are all 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 jacked up, and we're not listening. It's just a matter of uh, voice building is different from just singing things to wake your voice up, right? Mm -hmm. um, so even in a warm up where you know they should be singing with good technique, they should be singing with um, with proper vowels. They should be singing. Um, it should be helping build the voice to do whatever whatever it is that you're asking them to do in that particular rehearsal or uh, lending itself to the music. So uh, a typical rehearsal is going to be a lengthy warm up, uh, voice building exercises. Um, I try to incorporate sight reading even even with my college students. I try to incorporate some sight reading. Um, we do ear training. Uh, and this looks the same for um, honor choir situations. I, I treat them the same way that I would with my classroom, just in a limited amount of time. Um, I like to start with something that will get them, get them going in terms of repertoire, um, something that's successful that they will find immediate success. Um, after they found that immediate success, I ramp it up a little bit, and then whatever the, um, like the, the next, the a challenge, but not the most difficult thing. I would normally ha tackle that next. Um, the most difficult thing, I would then program in like the two thirds into the rehearsal, mm -hmm. um, kind of like the golden mean, right? You put the most difficult thing in that time where I, I have their attention the greatest right. uh, and, and really would shed and, and hammer that and then let them leave with some sort of success as well. Um, and so that's how I try to work a rehearsal. Uh, when I'm tackling things that are really difficult, I, um, I, I actually start with, I typically start with the most difficult sections first. Uh, and when you start with the most difficult section, that might not be at the beginning of the piece. How many times have we gone to like a choral festival or a, a you know CPA and um, and you hear a choir and they're singing a really difficult piece and it starts off really really well. Those first two pages are amazing, mm -hmm. and the last page is kind of like oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Clearly, they've started at the beginning every day and then many didn't times. many many times. Um, but if you start with the most difficult section of the piece, which might be at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it might be somewhere in the middle, and then you build out from there. 
Um, for example, if the most difficult pay piece of this, the most difficult part of this piece of music is on page eight, then we work, we start with page eight. And um, tomorrow when we come back to it, we go to page eight, but we add, you know, we might add pages seven and nine, mm -hmm. and then we sing through page eight. And so then the most difficult piece of, the dif most difficult part of that piece of music then becomes the most rehearsed. Right. Uh, and I think that I have found success in teaching um, very difficult literature in that way. Um, and yeah, I like to incorporate humor uh, into the rehearsal, but not so much that you lose the purpose of you know why we're here. We're here to we're here to make music, and we're here to build great musicians, and we're here to um, to learn about the music that we're singing. And I think that. Um, we are in a season now where people will feel like rehearsals have to be fun and I think that there's a place for that mm -hmm. but I also feel like there is fun in the success yeah and fun through the work yeah yeah yeah, when you feel like you have accomplished something through hard work at the end like this the, the satisfaction of, of that accomplishment I think um, is is fulfilling in and of itself. Uh, and so I think that students who work with me um, appreciate that. I've not always been that person. Um, I have learned lots of lessons from um, lots of amazing choir directors. Um, Ditto. Yeah. I learned, <laughs> you know, I, I've learned a lot about, you know, repertoire and, and whatnot just from having conversations with you, right? So... Um, yeah, I think that's what a typical rehearsal would look like in any I like context. That. And I like what you were saying about, you know, working on the most difficult thing and then working your way out. I call that kind of an additive process, and uh, I also call it peeling the onion. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it might make us cry a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. We're, we're peeling the onion, but eventually we're going to, you know, chop that up, add it with some other, you know, delicious parts of the meal and, and create a, a beautiful dish. Yes, yes. Know? So yeah, I love that. Okay, so um, this kind of ties into the same same line of thinking. But what are some uh, tips or pointers maybe for emerging choral leaders? Um, I could go pedagogical with this, but I think I'm going to go and go go a bit more generic. And so I think one, the first thing is just to be you. Mm -hmm. I think that. Every person is uniquely gifted and anointed, is a word I like to use, for, for to, to occupy space in this world. And there's something that every person brings to this world that only they can bring to the world. And I think the same thing is true for the choral classroom. There are ways that I will be able to reach my students that only I can that I, only I can reach them. Mm -hmm. And if I try to be someone else, then the space that I've been appointed to be in at this appointed time has been uh, and the students that I'm standing in front of, or the ensemble that I'm standing in front of at that appointed time, miss out on whatever gift that is in me that I'm supposed to be giving to, to that group of people. And by extension, we, in collaboration with that group of people, the gifts that we are going to give to the world or to the audience or to whomever. And so we want to make sure that we're always trying to be ourselves. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to be the next Moses Hogan. I don't want to be the next Andre Thomas. I don't want to be the next Anton Armstrong. And you know, as a black conductor, for example, people people say oh well you're you should aspire to be these things and I while I admire and appreciate the work that all of those folk have done in terms of choral music what I want to be is the very best Jeff Murdoch that I can be because there's something that only Jeff Murdoch can bring to the world and I want to make sure that I can be my very best best self so that for that appointed time in that space um, that I've been fortunate enough to occupy that those students get what they are supposed to get. And if I'm trying to be somebody else, they won't get what they're supposed to get from Jeff Murdoch. Um, um, so also remember that it's about the music and not about you. Um, 
you know, I hear, and I've said this from time to time, I've used the term my choir. Mm -hmm. um, and I've tried to move away from that language because the experience, the, the collaborative experience is not about me and what I want and, oh, you know, look at me and I, I, wanna, I wanna be, I want this choir to be great because if this choir is great, then I can become great and I can be um, asked to do more things and um, I can be elevated to different platforms. Um, I think that while all those things are great, I think that if, if you seek first to create an amazing choral experience where you are, then all of those other things will come. Um, and so I, it's interesting because, you know, I've, I've re received some awards for teaching and I have, um, you know, I'm now president of Southwest ACDA and um, I serve on the national board. But like, I did not go into places seeking those things. Um, uh, I don't walk into a room and lead with, it's funny that I'm mentioning it now because it's not something I usually do. But so I was a 2021 Grammy Music Educator of the Year. I did not seek that. Right. Um, someone nominated me because they saw what I do and and one of the reasons that I don't lead with that when I walk into a room is that I was Jeff Murdoch before that award. Mm -hmm. And I don't do anything different in the classroom now that I did before. And so I think that elevation and accolades and all of those things should be a result of the work that you're already doing, not you're doing work to receive those accolades. Completely agree. Yep. Um, and so that's, that's the second. Remember, it's about the music and it's not about you. And so, because once it becomes about you, it's just like I, I feel like I can always tell um, a, a choir that is singing under a self serving director. The sound is different, the emotional connection is different. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. So it's about it's about the music. It's not so, about you. So do the genuine work, and the accolades will come. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think it's important to note that you are shaping generations with everything that you do, with your repertoire choices, with your um, um, the way that you teach the life lessons that you bring to your classroom, to your ensemble, whatever context you're working in, um, and to be mindful of that. And to be mindful that people are watching you, whether you think they are or not. Um, a lot of what I did as a high school choir director was shaped by what I saw my middle school director do, my high school director do, my collegiate directors do, my um, and even in my doctoral program, what I saw those directors do, for better or worse. And so, future choir directors will look back on their time with you um, either fondly or not so fondly. And so what will, what will they take with them into their music careers as they shape future students? So just remember that as you're shaping the kid in front of you now, that kid could be shaping minds 20 years from now. Yeah. So I think those are my three big things. One, to be authentically you. Um, two, remember that it's about um, the music and about the about the shared collective experience. And, um, and finally, remember that you are shaping the minds for generations to come. Yeah, yeah there is that uh, meme saying of, you know, a good teacher can shape the minds of those uh, for generations to come, much like you said, but also a bad teacher can decimate mm -hmm. the, the musical uh, feelings of those for generations to come. Mm -hmm. so, yep. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Okay, so um, what, <laughs> I think I know this, but what do you do to relax or fight burnout? I don't. <laughs> uh, I don't. Uh, and I need to do better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you do. But <laughs> I, I do, I do, I do. I need to sit down somewhere, as my grandmother would say. Um, but I do like to um, unwind with mindless TV. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so what are you watching right now? All right, so <laughs> I'm ashamed. Uh, I am watching right now a show called Never Have I Ever, which is like a an 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 Hindu uh, Hindu an Indian um, like teen flick. Okay. About like this girl in an in an Indian family and her experiences in high school, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Uh, and I started watching it like, and couldn't couldn't get enough of it. So that's okay. Don't make fun of me. No, I'm not making don't fun judge of you. me. Not don't at all. judge me. Not at all. We all have our thing. Um, but I watch I watch just about anything. So I loved um, House of Cards when it was on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also um, like watching documentary documentaries like um, like the, the what well, those mini series like Dahmer or like the thing that oh, was yeah. uh, uh, that talked about the. Murdoch trials in South Carolina oh, like right. that. Mm-hmm. So I like watching those like real real life things. Um, but I also <laughs> just rediscovered um, The Office and, okay. Okay. Uh, and even things like I Love Lucy. So I watch just about anything. Um, Ozark was really cool. Uh-huh. Um, I just finished that. I just finished Manifest, uh, okay. the Netflix uh, series. Schitt's Creek. I will, I will watch that. <laughs> Over and over, and over honestly. and over and over again. I cannot get enough of Mora and David. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, those are those are things that I'm currently watching. So um, if I'm decompressing, um, I'm watching I'm watching something like that. Um, interestingly enough, I do music all day. So when I'm in my car, I do not listen to music. You and me both. Mm-hmm. Um, it might be silence. It might be. Um, it's usually like talk radio. Yeah. Um, just to kind of get all of the the day's worth of music out of my brain, and mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, it's sort of therapeutic for me. Sometimes I'm not even even listening to it, but just this soothing sound of people talking. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm um, similar in that way. I like to hike. Um, Arkansas is really beautiful um, at all times of the year, but um, it's called the natural state for a reason. Lots of beautiful trails and great mountains and great, um, uh, great uh, uh, waterfalls and, and scenic. You know, you can do water rafting and all kinds of cool things. So I, I do like nature mm-hmm. and uh, spending time with my family. Um, also, obviously, is uh, is a big thing. Do those things, do I do enough of that to stop me from burning out? Probably not. Um, but it's a start. Yeah, absolutely. Those are good answers. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so we're going to go into the cello rondo round then. Is okay. It, is it kind of uh, just whatever comes to your mind, first thing? Um, some of these are about choral music, and some of these have nothing to do with choral music. So... If you're down, we'll go ahead and start. So, what's the worst job you've ever had outside of choral music? KFC. I was a cashier at KFC. Okay. If you had to do any other job besides being a choral director, what would that be? Um, I'd be a meteorologist. Meteorologist? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Am I allowed to like elaborate? Yeah, you can elaborate. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I thought there was like a lightning round. Like I it is, it is, but word. you can expand. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as a kid, I lived um, near an Air Force base. Okay. And we used to go on field trips to Keesler Air Force Base, and we would go see the planes and all the things on the base. And so I would, they took us to see the Hurricane Hunters, where the huge aircraft that they fly into the oh, storms okay. to like check bar- barometric pressure and direction of the storms and all those things. I also was really into weather too because of hurricanes and how the weather would change so quickly uh, on the Gulf Coast. So I was going to go to school and I was going to learn meteorology. I was going to get a pilot's license and join the Air Force and fly hurricane hunters. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that about you. That's cool. All right, so then what's your favorite bad food to eat? Ramen, uh, not like ramen in a like in a real Asian restaurant, but like the like the kind you get in the bag that's uh-huh. like twelve cents. Yes, yeah. okay. Yes. And then like yeah, instant yes. ramen noodle. Okay, yes. all right. It's very high in sodium. It's very good. I have boxes of it at my house right now. It's boxes. a guilty pleasure. Is yes. It, is it, is it a, like a, a Costco or Sam's Club kind of purchase where you buy in bulk, or is it just 
as well, you, at, on a whim when you feel it. Oh no, it's uh, there's and my boys like it now too. There's like it's in our pantry that like, there's because you it's like it's like three dollars for like yes. eighteen of them. Yeah, it's pretty cheap yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at Walmart or Kroger or wherever. And so yeah, I, yeah, was, we I have, was I was a poor college student at one time. I understand. We, we have pa- <laughs> and it's amazing how like inflation has affected everything except mm, that like they're yep. still like twelve cents a, <laughs> That's not, a pack. Yeah, not but yeah, I, it's my there will always be that in my house. Okay. Love it. All right, so a choice here. What's, what was the scariest moment in your life or what's your biggest phobia? Um, actually, I'll do both. So the scariest moment in my life, I had a stroke uh, about mm-hmm. um, about six years ago and um, that puts a lot of things in perspective. Now, interestingly enough, it didn't make me slow down. I was going to say, we just, <laughs> we just finished the, the fighting burnout question. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Um, but it did prompt me to, to make some uh, some health choices because mm-hmm. um, I want to be around for my family. Yep. And, um, and yeah. Um, biggest phobia is being um, buried alive and or drowning. This idea of okay. being in an enclosed space that suffocates me. Uh-huh. Um, is is terrifying. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. All right, then. So, if you could have anyone on the Coral Mount Rushmore, who are the four that you would choose? Hmm. Um, um, the fir- the names that come to mind are um, Mozart, because Mozart. Um, um, I think Robert Shaw, when I talk to my uh, music education students, I talk about um, the different kinds of sounds that we create in, in people who helped define those sounds. Mm-hmm. And I think Robert Shaw was big in defining the American choral sound, whatever that is. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and I think on the opposite end of that, I think Eric Whitaker mm-hmm. was instrumental in helping to define a different sound that mm-hmm. is also America. Uh, and uh, William Dawson. William Dawson. Yeah, all great choices. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, uh, what is something that you spend way too much money on? <laughs> uh, I have two. One of them is I like crab legs, and you can buy them by the box at Walmart and Sam's Club. Mm-hmm. And at Kroger, we don't have Kroger in Northwest Arkansas, though it makes me sad. Yeah, um, but I will buy crab legs anytime, any day, any, and, it's, and it can become an expensive habit. Crab legs. Also, wine. Crab legs and wine. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sometimes together, those things. Why? Yeah. Why separate those two? I know. Yeah, right. right. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, okay, then what is a secret talent that people might be surprised to learn about you? Ooh, secret talent. It can be silly, it can be serious, it doesn't matter. I'm trying to think. I, f- I feel like all the things that I know how to do, like I only know how to do like four things. <laughs> and I think that <laughs> y'all see those things all the time or some version of them. Um, I don't know. Um, this one always trips people up. All right, so think about that one. We may come back to it. Okay, okay. So uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Um, it would be the ability to fix any problem. Okay. Super fixer. Super fixer. Yep. I like it. Okay. All right. You want to you wanna try again at the secret talent? Secret talent. Um, like, can you, uh, like, blow bubbles with your tongue or something like that? Or is it just to wiggle your ears? Or is it something more serious than that? I can't do any of those things. I'm pretty... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty... Now I'm feeling like I'm, I'm a boring dude. No. Because I can't do anything. Um, well, you do a lot already, so...
Now watch when this is over. I'm gonna be like, I remember. I, remember. I have. I, I have. A, or I'm gonna do the thing, and I'm gonna be like, oh, oh, I do that. I, I can. Yeah. Um, well, we'll have to amend it later. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 I can, really can't think of anything right now. That's all right. That's okay. Well, either way, you achieve tempo presto. So there we go. Okay. All okay. Right. Okay. So going back to some choral music questions, then uh, who's another choral musician that you'd like to lift up right now? Um, Dr. Jabari Glass. Um, Jabari's the associate University director of South Carolina. Yep, South okay. Carolina. Um, Go Gamecocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, as a as a young teacher, and it's interesting because Jabari's younger than I am. Mm -hmm. um, but as a young educator, I remember being in my classroom, and I, I've known him. We went to school both in Mississippi around the same time, and um, so we would see each other at Five Mu Alpha things and at you know collaborative choral things that our universities would do. Um, he went to Ole Miss while I was at Southern Miss. Okay. Um, but when he started teaching, I noticed the way that he developed voices and the way that he developed music literacy was something that I wanted to learn how to do. I brought him into my classroom and it was a life-changing experience, not just for my students, but for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and since that time, I have learned so much about the art of being a choir director from him. Um, he is a phenomenal musician. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal conductor, phenomenal clinician, um, and if if you ever have an opportunity to work, watch him work, I think um, you'll be changed for the better. Um, and I've, he's also a wonderful personal friend of mine. So um, I'm a bit I'm a bit biased, but uh, he became my friend after um, after having experienced his brilliant brilliant. So. Mm -hmm. um, I would have said this if he weren't my friend. Sure. Well, I'm a South Carolina alum, but uh, I haven't had the chance to meet Jabari yet, but mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to meeting him and, and seeing him work a little bit. So. Yep, yep. He's one of our clinicians for the yep. for Southwest ACDA. That's right. Hashtag limitless. That's right. That's right. Okay, so uh, let's let's talk about, uh, and we can talk about this in the context of the, the conference, but what are some goals that you have personally for you? What are you working on? What are you looking forward to in the next year? All right, so yes, a successful conference. Uh -huh. um, this summer we are launching the first cohort of the Master of Music and Black Sacred Music just here in a couple weeks. Right. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, uh, I am conducting Mozart's Requiem in Carnegie Hall in the spring oh, as well. Congratulations. Um, thanks. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, some projects at the university. Um, um, we've got some cool things with the... Uh, cool collaborations during marching season with the Razorback Marching Band and Inspirational Chorale, so I'm looking forward to that. Mm. Look for us on ESPN. Okay. Uh, um, the choirs are doing, the University of Arkansas choirs are doing Beethoven 9 in the spring as well. Okay. Uh, we were supposed to do it before COVID and then COVID happened. COVID. Mm -hmm. But this is a great year because this is the 200, 2024 is the 200th anniversary of the premiere of Beethoven's 9, so it worked out. Um, and you know various singing things, um, lots of cool honor choirs. I think one of the coolest honor choir opportunities I've had so far, well I've done it yet. It's in the spring. Is I'm doing the uh, so the American schools in foreign countries have honor choirs. So like in Europe, for example, all the American school association comes together and they do an honor choir mm -hmm. for like you know the American schools of Europe and then the American schools of Asia. So I'm conducting in Seoul, South Korea, okay. the American School of Asia Honor Choir. So are these like expats or? No, these are, um, so in some cases, yes. Okay. Uh, but in other cases, it, they, they may be just um, Americans who for whatever reason are living in, um, you know, Shanghai and there's this American school. Yeah, or, yeah. Um, yeah, so okay. I'm super stoked about that. That sounds fun. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we're wrapping up here. So how can folks get in, best get in touch with you if they want to? So you can find me on the Facebook. I say the Facebook. The Facebook. I was, because I joined Facebook when Facebook was... It was in its the, infancy. Yep, yep. Mm, me too. It was the Facebook. You had to have a .edu email address right. to be on it. Right. Um, so that means we're old. It means we're old. <laughs> it means we're old. 
Um, Jeffrey Allen Murdoch on Facebook. Um, that's J E F F R E Y, spelled the correct way. Hey, the careful. correct way. Mine is E R Y. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. No, I know. Okay. Um, so yeah, so Jeffrey Allen Murdoch uh, on Facebook. J. Allen Murdoch on everything else. So um, my Instagram is J. Allen Murdoch. My Twitter is also J. Allen Murdoch. Um, you can find the Inspirational Corral also and things um, like that on, on YouTube. Just look up University of Arkansas Inspirational Corral. My email is um, Jeffrey M. at uark.edu, uark.edu. Um, and yeah, let's connect. Uh, I will, I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. I'm happy to talk to anybody about anything. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I love Connect. Awesome. Well, thanks for making this connection on the Connections podcast. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing how, you know how people react to getting to know you a little better, and hopefully that generates uh, some more buzz and interest in this uh, conference that's coming up. And uh, limitless. Limitless. Hashtag limitless. All right. Thank you, my friend. Thank you.